Good afternoon. I'm Abe. And I'm Frank. And today, we're adumbrating Unit 2 in Meyer's Psychology for AP. Research Methods. Thinking Critically with Psychological Science. Fasten your seatbelts. It's about to get really exciting. All right, here we go with Unit 2. Frank will be taking it away. I'll start us off with the first uh, phenomenon of psychological science, which is hindsight bias. Hindsight bias is the tendency to believe that you knew it all along upon hearing research findings. So we have two examples of this. The first can be seen in a stock market crash. Essentially, when everyone sells their stocks, it can be easy looking back to see, oh, why did I buy those stocks? It was obviously the, that they were going to fail. But at the moment, it seems pretty, uh, they would seem successful and you would want to buy them. Another example is terrorist attacks. Looking back, it can seem obvious that terrorists would try to take advantage of the system of low checks at airports and no and no no fly lists, uh, and that's seen looking back. But at the time, uh, not having checks at airports and not having no fly lists was simply the way things are done. Now let's move on to the scientific attitude. And there's two main tenets of this philosophy. The first is skepticism, and the second one's humility. So really quickly, skepticism is simply being skeptical about different claims. If Abe here claims that he's the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, I am. I'm going to be skeptical about that, and I'm going to ask him things that only Jesus would know. And maybe or maybe not, he'll be able to answer. The second thing is humility, admitting that you don't know something when you don't know it. Essentially, that's not making false claims. It's just say, stating exactly what you know and not uh, making assertions that you can't back up with evidence. I am omniscient. Yes. Abe ignores both these rules. I am an exception. <laughs> we'll move on then to critical thinking, which assesses all parts of a claim, everything from the initial assertion to the evidence used to support it. So this goes along with what we were just talking about with the scientific attitude. Basically, you're being skeptical about stuff, and you're also being... Uh, you're using a lot of humility. You're admitting if you don't know something, but you're challenging other people's claims and challenging their evidence and their assertions. So we'll move on again to the scientific method overall. This part's pretty easy. There are six total steps in the scientific method. method. You start out with a question, then you do some research on that question. You form a hypothesis based on your research. You experiment to prove that hypothesis, and then you do some analysis. And if that analysis doesn't make sense, you go back to researching. But if it does make sense, sense you're allowed to form a conclusion. Your hypothesis becomes a conclusion. All right, let's talk about description. There are three main ways for describing things that psychologists use. There are case studies, surveys, and naturalistic observation. So a case study is basically examines one individual in depth in order to uh, find out some general qualities about the human population. It prompts further study, and it's necessary that after case study, we use other research me methods, such as surveys. Now, wording in surveys are very important. Depending on your word choice, it can provoke different responses. And random sampling is also very important in surveys. Basically, it's taking a sample that fairly represents a population because any member of the population should have an equal chance to be chosen for the sample. That's random sampling. So lastly, naturalistic observation is the third way of describing things, and it's basically observing behavior in natural situations without manipulating the situations. Like So basically, it's offering naturalistic observation offers snapshots of everyday life. And right there, we have a picture of a uh, of random sampling. Ran people are randomly chosen. And then there's a picture of this woman very creepily watching this <laughs> little boy do his homework. But that's a snapshot of everyday life. It's naturalistic observation. I think that's illegal. Yeah. All right, so we're going to dive into correlations right now. So when one trait is related to another, we say that those traits are correlated. It's important to note that correlations are only indicative of possibilities. We can't use correlations to prove what the cause of something is. So correlation doesn't prove causation. No, no. So right here we have an example of a positive correlation because both sets of data increase or decrease together or at the same time. There are also negative correlations in which one set of data rises while the other falls. And we can see that in this other graph right here. So finally, we also have something called illusory correlations, which are, which are basically fake correlations. There's a funny comic about that uh, right here. Oh, An example is, is yes. An example is random coincidences because we can perceive them as correlated, but in actuality, they're just random. 
So an illusory correlation is a perceived but non-existent correlation between two things. All right, so we can talk about experimentation right now. The basic idea of an experiment is isolating cause and effect, and psychologists do two things during an experiment. They manipulate factors and determine their effects while controlling other factors. So uh, there are different types of procedures that can be used as experiments. One example is a double-blind procedure in which neither the research staff nor the participants know which group receive a treatment. The experimental group is the group of people who receive the treatment, and the control group is the group of people who don't receive a treatment. Now, also involved in experimentation is the placebo effect, which is basically administering an inert substance, which the recipient believes is an active agent, and then measuring the effects of all that. Uh, so the overall idea of experiments is psychologists manipulate an independent variable, or a variable that stays constant and doesn't change, and they measure the dependent variable, or a quality that does change with the experiment, while controlling the confounding variable, which is any other factor other than the independent variable that might produce an effect during an experiment. So a pharmaceutical company could use a placebo to control for an illusory correlation? In psychological terms, yes. Excellent. Well, unfortunately now we have to move on to the one of the most boring sections of this entire book, describing data. Come on, this Frank, is... math is fun. <laughs> yeah, sure. Basically, we'll just speed through these mathematical terms. They're really simple. You'll get them right off the bat. So mode is the point in a set of data that occurs the most. So in our set of data at the bottom there, 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, 7, 8, the mode would be 7. Mean is the average, so you add them all up and then divide by the total amount of data. So you'd add up all those points and then divide by 7. You end up getting 4.85. Median is just the middle of the data, so count in from both sides, you'll get 5. Range is the highest data point minus the smallest, so here you'll get 7. Really simple, if you have any trouble with that, uh, you may have trouble with the course in general. But let's move on. Making inferences. So here there are three key points about making inferences from a set of data. The first is that representative, uh, representative samples are better. Essentially when you're uh, studying a group of people, you want them to represent like not just all white Catholic middle-aged men, like the Republican Party. You want them to represent everyone inside your set of data. So if you're measuring people in America, you want to have men and women and all types of ethnicities and all different races and all different religions. So you want your sample to represent your population. Second, less variables are better. This is kind of goes back to what Abe was talking about when he was talking about experiments. You're controlling for one variable. You're seeing if there's a cause and effect between the one variable you're looking at. So if there's a lot of other factors influencing your population, that's not going to be a good scientific study to make inferences from. And third and finally, straight up, more cases are better. The more examples you have to prove their point, to, to prove your point, the stronger your point is going to be. So let's move on. Psychology applied. All right, so the purpose of an experiment is to test theoretical principles. Psychologists care most about discovering general principles that help explain behaviors. They don't really care about unique behaviors. They want, they emphasize the general over the unique. Culture also plays a factor in shaping our behavior, such as our tendency to be casual or formal or our conversational distance. And gender matters too. Gender also shapes our behavior. So we can see right here, while Frank and I, being men, are more likely to talk about information and advice, our female counterparts are more likely to carry on conversations in order to build relationships. Interesting. Now let's talk about ethics and research. Basically, uh, ethics are, you know, they're kind of up to what country you're living in, essentially. Inside America, ethics are dictated by the American Psychological Association, which has created a set of rules for uh, experiments on human beings. For example, in every experiment conducted, the human has to give their consent. And when the experiment is over, they have to be informed of what the results were and what the experiment were. However, they don't need to be told what the experiment is. For example, if you go in to take a placebo of Adderall, they don't need to tell you at the time what everyone who's taking the Adderall is getting. You'll just know that you're inside the experiment. You won't really know what they're testing. For animals, it's a bit different. Animals can experience pain. They can be dissected, but it has to be in an ethical environment. So that's the main difference between experimenting on humans and animals. For humans, the American Psychological Association has decided that 
if consent is given, minimal pain is ethical. However, for animals, animals obviously do not give their need to give their consent, and a lot more pain can be given. So there's a controversy there about how much how much rights animals should have when they're being experimented on. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. And